Hello, and welcome to the webcast, Next Generation Oceanographic Research, Robots Talking to Robots. My name is Peter Elliman. I'm with Liquid Robotics, and I have with us today two people who will be speaking to you about the work that has been done with the wave gliders. We have Brian Kieft from the Monterey Bay Research Institute in Bari, and Liquid Robotics, we have Graham Hine, our co-founder and a senior vice president of global partner development. The agenda today, we'll, Graham will talk to you briefly about the wave glider, and then we'll hand it over to Brian, who will go through uh, a bit on who Mbari is and some of the applications um, for the wave gliders at Mbari, and more specifically how they've been using the wave glider to talk to uh, both other robots, such as AUVs, as well as sensors, and then a little bit about um, where they're going um, sort of beyond today. So with that, I will turn it over to um, Graham. Thanks a lot, Peter, and uh, thank you, Brian, for joining in today. Uh, it's really exciting to learn more about what Embari is doing with WaveGlider. Uh, you guys have been at the cutting edge of using WaveGlider since we uh, since we first got started, one of our first phone calls uh, asking whether or not this was a good idea or a bad idea was to Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. So, so thanks. It's uh, it's been a long long haul, but we're here and uh, we've been doing some really cool work and some really interesting science. So, uh, looking forward to hearing more. Um, a little bit of background for the folks uh, who are watching who haven't uh, been familiar with the wave glider. It is an unmanned surface vehicle, so it rides on the surface of the ocean energy harvesting, so it collects all of the energy from the environment that it's in. And the primary innovation here is the wave power system. So it's using wave energy for propulsion. It uses solar energy to charge up batteries. The batteries can run all the payloads and sensors and scientific equipment the wave-powered vehicle can, can carry. Uh, what that enables is for the vehicle to perform essentially continuously, um, really limited only by mechanical and the environmental um, uh, fouling, um, but that gives, lets you work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Uh, we've done very long missions with the vehicles, mul multiple months up to years in duration. Uh, the system has, uh, there's almost 400 of them out there now. They've done over a million nautical miles collectively. So it's not a new, uh, new platform anymore. It's actually been at sea for quite some time, but the applications are really starting to blossom. Uh, the one we're going to be focusing on a little bit today is the communications gateway capability. Uh, and that's, uh, that's really important because radio waves don't penetrate seawater and acoustics don't work really well in air despite uh, what the audio on this conference call might lead you to believe. Um, that kind of uh, ability to bridge the acoustic world with the radio frequency world uh, lets folks operate at sea underwater, lowering risks at sea, reducing costs. And of course, this has been designed as an open and extensible platform, and that lets our our good partners like uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute um, innovate on the platform, try new things, and, and, and tie it into other systems. So going through the WaveGlider's architecture a little bit, starting from the top, up in the float, which is we creatively call the float, uh, we have power, commute, uh, compute, and communications. Really, there's a core command and control system that communicates back to shore, usually by satellite, Iridium satellite, but it can also communicate via cell phone or other radio system. Uh, the solar panels on the top will charge batteries inside that box. You can have additional battery packs, uh, power units on board. You can store payloads inside the float. Um, the float is connected by a streamlined high-strength umbilical. Eight meters is standard. We've done up to 20 and as little as four. That connects you to the propulsion system. That submarine body uh, is our wing rack. Uh, those wings articulate up and down as the waves pass by and drive the system forward. A little fin in the back is our rudder. That's what steers it, not the fin at the back of the float, but the fin at the back of the sub. And a uh, solar electric thruster was added to the latest version of the wave glider. So if it's calm seas and a sunny day and the wave energy isn't uh, enough to get the job done, the solar electric thruster can be fired up and provide some additional speed. So the system can act really as a sensor platform, and because it's collecting energy from the environment, it's effectively 
while it's out there, continually harvesting available energy. And until we run out of sun and waves, uh, at which point we will have other problems, we really have a continuous power source at sea. Uh, we talked a little bit about the communications gateway platform. Uh, Brian's going to show us a little bit more about how you can really make that sing. And uh, the system is capable of navigating autonomously on its own. So it has quite a bit of compute on board. You can program it to operate it in, in pre-programmed courses or to respond to its environment. So that allows you to essentially let these things go and run on, run on their own, but because you're in constant communications back to shore, you can actually uh, intervene and uh, retask the vehicle at any time, depending on what you're seeing by looking over the shoulder of the vehicle. So all this enables these wave gliders, and you can you know, see the see our wave glider image at the center of the screen. I think that's how everybody draws their own picture. But uh, really, it's, it's a little bit true in this case. The wave glider, by residing at the surface, is connecting the subsea, and again, that acoustic realm, with the aerial realm. So you'll see uh, the wave glider acting as a communications gateway from a sensor on the seafloor all the way up to space and satellite and then back to shore. And all of these dotted lines here have been done in one form or another. So we have had communications and fish tracking measurements and underwater vehicles talking to wave gliders and positioning applications to seafloor instruments and connections with unmanned aerial vehicles and aircraft and satellites and ships and rigs. So it really is a completely connected environment, but it's only been done in microcosm. And uh, what we're seeing now is that this sort of connected network at sea is providing an infrastructural footprint in the ocean, what we're calling a digital ocean footprint. And that is enabling these other resources to work, be more effective. So it's a multiplier of capability at sea. And as these, these sort of connected realms start to be deployed, more and more, uh, more and more capability is enabled for folks to operate at sea in a cost-effective way. And here I'd like to pass it along to Brian. Brian, uh, thanks for, again, thanks for joining us and look forward to hearing what, uh, what you've been up to. Yeah, thanks, Graham and Peter. Appreciate uh, the opportunity, and uh, it sure has been great working with uh, all of you as we uh, occasionally try to integrate some things that might be considered a little bit crazy on these platforms. But uh, as you mentioned, they are extensible, and uh, we have uh, taken that opportunity and, and uh, operate these wave gliders now um, almost 250 days a year out here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. We've got uh, three of them. They've traveled uh, already... 26,000 kilometers or so uh, at sea, and that's just for our new, our two new SV3 vehicles, which uh, have some major improvements over the uh, original commercially available wave glider. We really like those new vehicles. So um, maybe just first a little bit of background on what, uh, who we are institutionally and, and where we're located. So Imbari for short, it's the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. We were founded by David Packard, and we're privately funded by the Packard Foundation. And uh, the goal of Dave Packard was to get engineers and scientists really working together in the same space to innovate and to solve some of these uh, pretty uh, large roadblocks uh, for exploring the deep ocean. We're located conveniently actually near some deep ocean. We're on Monterey Bay, right at the mouth of the Monterey Bay Submarine Canyon. That's this image over here on the right. You can see that uh, pretty quickly we get into very deep water that's actually goes out to about 4,000 meters deep. So uh, right in our backyard, we have deep water, uh, a very diverse oceanscape with lots of coastal upwelling, tons of different species uh, migrating through this bay. It's often called the Serengeti of the sea. And so we use our wave gliders as, a, uh, as part of a, a greater suite of instruments and autonomous vehicles and ships and moorings and, and various types of instrumentation that we use to try to get a more synoptic look at what's going on out there in the ocean, which is pretty hard to do. We're trying to maintain a persistent presence in a, in a very challenging environment. And so this wave glider works alongside uh, many other things and actually enables their capability and allows us to do some, some kind of cool new stuff that we hadn't been able to do a number of years ago. So I'll go through some of those applications and just tell the story about a few of them. There's there's many more that we won't be able to touch on. Uh, one of the things we've done to our our wave gliders here is we've added a package that that Graham referred to. It's this 
we call it a hotspot. It's an acoustic and a radio relay that we've we've added to the wave glider, and it's useful for uh, tracking and, and locating underwater assets. We've also added a uh, an ocean acidification package, uh, looking at uh, PCO2 and the air sea interface, and we've got some homing capabilities that could be useful for things like docking in the future. So here's here's this acoustic side of things. This is great. Uh, we've got uh, some acoustics underneath the float, and what it allows us to do is to actually autonomously chase or follow or track, whatever you want to call it, uh, submerged uh, instruments like autonomous underwater vehicles. One of the ones we use a lot is our long-range AEV here, pictured on the left, and this is an AEV that can hover or drive around with a propeller, and it's really convenient to have the wave glider uh, follow it along uh, for, for certain applications, which we'll get into. Uh, the wave glider can also search and home in on a target, uh, like this benthic rover over here on the right. This rover is 4,000 meters deep, and it's a couple hundred kilometers offshore. So it's really convenient to send a wave glider out there and find this thing. When things move, uh, it's a lot better to have a wave glider locating things than, than to employ a ship to do that sort of initial search. And uh, then we also have the, the flip side. Our EVs can actually chase the other direction and, and come after the wave glider and home to it uh, and its acoustics. And for things like docking or just providing some contextual data deeper in the water column around a centroid like a, like a wave glider, that's very useful. You can have a constellation of robots in this uh, digital ocean moving about and maintaining that persistent observing presence out there. Now on the top side, we've got the radio frequency additions. We've thrown a few uh, more antennas on the wave glider than and there might normally be. We've got a cell phone, Wi-Fi, and some satellite radios on board. And they sit mostly right in here in the middle with the rest of the antennas. And we've noticed really, really good performance uh, with these taller antennas. You can see here, uh, the wave glider does take some waves, at least out here, operating in Monterey Bay. And having those antennas up nice and high is, is really good. You get really good reception as compared with our vehicles that sit lower in the water. So what's neat about this is since the wave glider is always on the surface, it can rendezvous with other platforms and data can be transferred quickly over a high speed link and that platform can go back underwater and the wave glider can take its time. Uh, it can come into shore and transfer data via cell phone or transfer it via a cheaper uh, Global Star uh, satellite data pathway, whatever it wants to do. But the point is it's helping to keep other vehicles off the surface where they belong uh, underwater doing their job. Here's what that uh, acoustic package looks like. This is a, a transducer that we've mounted to the skeg uh, of our SV3 vehicle. And this is a, it's called a directional acoustic transponder, a DAT. And it's, it's really just technically an inverted ultra short baseline. So it sends out a ping, gets a response, and you get a, a range and a bearing and an elevation to your target. Uh, that is great in and of itself, except it gets more exciting when we can drive, sort of backseat drive the wave glider using the liquid robotics command and control interface. So we take in that bearing and elevation from the DAT, and we also take in the GPS location from the main uh, vehicle computer on the wave glider. And then we compute where that target is on, on the Earth. And we've got a, a little extra safety net here just in case that location wants to go put us up on the rocks. We make sure that we're in a safe operational polygon and after double checking that we command the wave glider itself to go drive to that location. And then we just repeat and repeat and we can follow these targets wherever they might drift and, uh, and just keep right on top of them. So that came in handy just a couple weeks ago. This is a coastal profiling float. We've been tracking it just like I described. It was deployed from a ship. It was sitting in the water column moving up and down, and everything was, was actually going great for a couple days, and we were following it as we usually do. And then one day, they deployed it off the ship, and it didn't come back. And this was in the middle of a big field campaign this fall, and the ship really had other things to be doing at that time. So we sent in the wave glider, and, and we localized on this, uh, there was a modem on the side of this thing. We localized on it and got a location, and a couple weeks later, when the ship was back, it was able to dive, and they went down with the ROV and found this imploded instrument 
within Ouch. two meters of where the uh, yeah, it's pretty. You can see the twisted metal there. It's pretty torn up. Yeah, uh, pressure is dangerous. <laughs> it is. It is, and we're happy that the modem didn't implode as well. But um, but the wave glider found it and let the ship go do its thing. And uh, when they dove, they said it was just exactly right where we told them it was gonna be. So. That's great. Um, sometimes it's great for uh, the planned, and it's also great for the unplanned, I guess. <laughs> point there. Yep. So here's an example, uh, more of a science example of how we use the wave glider uh, in conjunction with a bunch of other instruments to solve a, a fairly difficult problem that uh, I think is fairly unique to the ocean. And and this is looking at a bloom, and it's it's really looking at what's happening inside a mass of water. So let's say you're a, a biologist who studies a certain type of tree, and you want to see how this tree evolves as it grows and maybe what impacts other trees have on it in the forest. Uh, it's pretty easy for you as a biologist to go out to the forest, you walk up to your tree every day, you take some notes, and maybe you can instrument the tree, watch how it grows. Uh, it's not that easy if you're a biologist and you want to study a, a mass of water that's moving in three dimensions in the ocean. And so this is a problem, uh, and we want to be able to sit in that water mass and watch it evolve and watch this phytoplankton bloom and then all the way to bust. So it'll sort of just pop up. And then preferably, as we follow this water mass, we could bring in other things like ships and maybe other AEVs. And we could collect samples both in the water mass and then outside the water mass to see what's happening contextually. And so this is called uh, basically sampling in the Lagrangian frame. We're going to be moving with this mass of water through space and through time as this bloom happens and then as it sort of goes away or busts. And so to do that, we use again our, our long range AEV and, uh, and the wave glider. So we start with one AEV that's just hovering like a blimp and it's the one that's gonna sit in the water mass. And it can't come up. If it leaves, it's out of the water mass and your experiment's over, you're done. So we stick another AEV out there to circle it, again using acoustics, and it's going to get some contextual data and some vertical uh, water column data. And then the wave glider, this is the important part. It's going to track that drifter while it drifts for days on end. And since it's on the surface, it reports back and tells us where this drifter or where this water mass is going. And then every day, things, other assets and people and things come out, like our ship or other AEVs, or maybe the ship puts out an AEV. But basically they can come in and they can sample right inside the water mass. They don't have to go looking for the drifter, which by the way moves quite a bit over the course of the day. And they can poke holes with their CCD right in the middle of this water mass and then move to the side and get contextual data. And it's a very efficient way to uh, track a water mass. So here's what that actually looked like uh, just a couple years ago. And we do this fairly frequently now around here. That looks like something I've drawn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is a this is one of those tests. Um, so the green line is the drifting AUV that's hanging mm -hmm. out in the water mass, and then we've got the red line, which is the wave glider following it along, and then that orange color that's the uh, that's that profiling contextual AUV. So you can see here that sometimes it's going pretty quick. It's over uh, two days actually, and you can see it's moving many kilometers over that time. Sometimes kind of fast, and then sometimes kind of slow. So. It's but it really, shows you really would have lost that tree if you just went back to the same place twice, right? You never would have measured the same water mass twice. Totally had, gone, yeah. Within, within like, you know, an hour, it's, it's gone. You've lost the whole thing. And, and, right. Uh, and you don't know what's going on in that particular mass of water anymore. It's, everything's changed. So you're not looking at the same thing. If you just stick a mooring there, it's, you know, it's no longer the same water. You don't know what's going on in that bloom and, and how it's right. impacting it evolving. So. We tend to think of moorings as stationary, but really they're not relative to the water. They're moving relative to the water, and the water is sort of stationary relative to itself. Exactly, and that's the Lagrangian uh, aspect here, where we're actually moving with the water. So technically, yeah, we're stationary, even though with reference to Earth, we're, we're moving, right? So when I float down the river in my inner tube, I'm Lagrangian drifting. Exactly. That sounds way yeah. more sophisticated. <laughs> it, it does, yeah. That's going to get a lot of street cred on the river, I'm, I'm sure, yes. That's good. Uh, here's another application that we're doing uh, literally, actually on my other screen here, I'm driving our wave glider to this uh, location out here on the, on the upper right. You can see uh, this red line, that's a 200 or so kilometers off our coast, just north of Point Conception. 
And down there, 4,000 meters under the water, is this benthic rover we introduced earlier. And this rover is uh, looking at uh, basically what's the coupling between the surface of the ocean and then the benthos, the seafloor, and how the critters down there get their food. And it drives along. It's got these little monster truck treads on it. And it drives along occasionally and puts in some instrumentation into the seafloor, takes some data, and then drives off again. And so uh, the wave glider's been nice. We sent that out there now. I think this is the fifth time. It's down there right now, and it's looking for uh, which way this which way this robot has moved. You know, is it going the right direction? We can pull a little bit of data off of it and make sure that the sensors are all still working appropriately. And we can just basically say, yeah, things seem okay and everything's working normally. Don't need to send a ship down there because as you can imagine, that'd be extremely expensive. It takes a day or so to get down there, the whole crew, and then they've got to potentially do the same thing we do except with a bunch of people. So. The wave glider has been great uh, to have working uh, down there with these types of, of assets. One more that we just introduced uh, a couple of years ago is called a benthic event detector. And so in our big submarine canyon that you saw, we have things called sediment and debris flows. Uh, think of them as, as like an underwater avalanche, you know, or landslide that's moving down this canyon. And until now, uh, geologists really didn't know how often they occurred, uh, how fast things were moving down the canyon, um, just sort of the the strength of these uh, sediment debris flows, how long uh, they were along the canyon, those kind of things. So we made an instrument called the benthic event detector, or BED, and it lives in the seabed. And um, it basically rides these avalanches down the canyon, and while, while it's riding, it's furiously recording the dynamics of motion. And so it's got all this great data on it, but the only problem is it's now buried under the under the mud. So we use the wave glider to go out. First of all, we have to find the thing because it can move quite far, tens of kilometers. And then once we find it, we want to get that data off of there, and we animate the motion and, and see how things look. And uh, and having done this originally uh, from a little boat for about 10 hours, it's it's a very very uh, slow link because of, of the burial. Uh, it's been really nice to use the wave glider to just sit out there. And the rest of us can go about our business here in our climate controlled environment and uh, the data just shows up which is really neat we've got about six of these things out right now and they've collected data from at least a dozen events or so um, so this is very novel uh, data that really doesn't exist anywhere else in the world and i don't think yeah i've never hard. heard of anybody else doing this uh, brian this is pretty innovative it's pretty cool um, and it'd be really ugly to try to bring it back with a human in the loop so um yeah always I would yeah. have a bit of a smirk on my face while I'm drinking my coffee and allowing the wave glider to uh, to go. <laughs> certainly, certainly covers the dull dull part of dull, dirty, dangerous. <laughs> exactly. That's good. So here's just here's a little plot of these uh, of these things moving down the canyon. This is this is sort of toward shore or upper canyon. Think uh, think higher, and then this would be down the track, so deeper water down here. And it, it's not easy to see all this all these numbers, but Basically, this red dot here is 10 kilometers away from where it started up here. And these things are moving pretty fast, uh, depending on which event it was. We're talking about six knots, you know, those kinds of speeds, three meters per second, something like that. So they're, they're really cranking down that canyon some of these, uh, for some of these sediment debris flows. Uh, for us, we're, we're kind of always looking ahead at what, what we can do next with these platforms. And... Docking is something that always comes up. We've, we've done some homing to the wave glider, and we're, we are thinking that docking is going to be a nice next step. Echo sounders are coming a long ways. There's some great stuff out there to tow along, and we plan to integrate an echo sounder this year or next. A lot of fish tagging going on in our, in our neck of the woods here in Monterey Bay, and we'd like to um, not just receive those tags, but actually kind of figure out where they're coming from, and maybe see if we can do a little bit of following for some of these slower moving animals. For instance, uh, tag jellyfish, for example, something like that. And then the, uh, the wave glider, if it can tow a tow body, one would think it could probably tow just about anything that looks like a tow body. So why not tow out an AUV, wait for some of these great blooms we talked about, and then cut it loose, you know, or tow it to some very remote location make sure it's got a full battery, and then cut it loose to, uh, to do its science and, and let it swim back on its own. And, uh, and then I think we're looking forward to uh, 
work that's coming up, I believe, with a, a winch CTD that Liquid Robotics has been working on and certainly plan to augment some of our time series runs that are typically done with a ship and, uh, and let the robot go ahead and, and, and do those kind of uh, CTD casts in the future. So some exciting stuff uh, over the next few years here coming up uh, at Embari with respect to the wave glider. That's great. Uh, thanks so much, Brian. That was really interesting. There's uh, obviously cool stuff you guys have been doing um, and cool stuff on the horizon. I'm looking forward to seeing the AUV docking and the tow out. I think um, as we start to really plug these systems together, we're going to see that digital ocean realized. And that's, uh, that to me is um, <clears throat> what's going to enable us to try a whole bunch of new and different science applications using this type of platform and these, uh, these systems of systems that should be out there. Agreed. Yeah, it really is about a system of systems too. It's uh, it's kind of working together to uh, to get that synoptic view or to get the work done, whatever it may be. But it's uh, it's been fun to watch everything start to come together. Yeah, and you can't forget the creative minds back at the shop who have to interpret all this uh, data. I mean, it's not uh, it's not always obvious what's happening out in the ocean, even when you have good data feeds. But at, uh, with the with the right um, the right folks looking at it, you can usually make sense of it. It's pretty pretty neat to see. That's right. Great. Um, Appreciate you all uh, elaborating more, and uh, maybe just as you as you um, wrap up a bit more, because uh, we're we're so proud to have Embari uh, as one of our customers and so close to us, um, allowing us to um, work with them and and hear a lot about their work. Maybe as you um, just touch on a bit more uh, some of the other institutions and sort of close out. Um, if you and Brian have a, a couple of other things maybe you might want to um, highlight, that'd be great to hear about. Sure. Um, well, the slide up on the screen now kind of shows some of the other institutes, research institutions we're working with globally. And, um, you know, I think it's incredible what's happening worldwide. It, it's, not, uh, it's not a localized phenomenon. It really is global. You know, we start to look at where the wave glider has been used and you can literally draw a line from Antarctica to the Arctic, from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean, and see where this sort of equipment is being deployed. And it's it's really really is neat, and it's being you know, the, the way is really being led by the researchers. So, you know, the the work that Brian and others are doing is uh, is paving the way for how this equipment gets used. And what that's what that's turning into is is really that industry and um, and governments can start to use this operationally, and uh, that's kind of that's kind of when things start to pay off because they can deploy at scale, and and uh, for, for us we can start to see larger out deployments of these systems, which in turn enables more science. It's a it's a virtuous cycle. Uh, so yeah, thanks. I think, to all I our think when you mentioned the uh, the economies of scale there too, that's a really good point. Uh, we've uh, Liquid's got this user group that. Uh, it, it, members all over the world using these platforms really uh, instructive and I guess more productive to uh, to be able to chat with other users and doing similar things in different parts of the world and, and sharing our development uh, both advances and challenges as we as we go through and try to use these platforms in new ways so it's been great to uh, to chat with people as you mentioned just all over the place doing uh, new and innovative things with these wave ladders that's cool, and, and um, yeah, no, I, I think that the users group has really been helpful to get people together because we, you know, we Liquid Box obviously has to respect customer data, so we're not uh, generally um, talking about exactly what our customers are doing, but when our customers can talk together and collaborate, I think it's uh, it's neat to see what comes out of that. Um, really, some good collab, good good, good cooperative work uh, is a result. Yeah, agreed. Maybe a last little question: Have you ever uh, those those BEDs, the benthic uh, <laughs> event detectors? Detector. Um, yeah. yeah, those are uh, so they're actually kind of in the mudslide, just sliding down the canyon. Um, that's got to be a pretty rough job. It, it is, though. You know, they've come back. Uh, I guess less beat up than you might think. Um, uh, so, for, so it's more of a mudslide than a, than a rock slide, I guess. Yeah, in this case it is, and I think canyons around the world are are potentially different. Um, but yeah, in our case, you know, they they fare pretty well. Um, and we're looking for different uses for these things too. There's a lot of interest for some other canyons in the world, and and potentially some um, applications for you know monitoring undersea uh, assets and things like that. You know, so um, it's been kind yeah. of neat to see those and and how they've 
integrated with the wave glider and it's really been a team effort i don't think we could have done it without uh, both sides of that equation so right right you know and and what's what's interesting is i've been talking to some folks in the oil and gas world where you know they have subsea infrastructure near areas where the seabed is a little bit mobile and it is tricky for them to figure out how the seabed will move is moving um because and that and that of course affects the undersea infrastructure. So it's got to be an engineering challenge to figure this out as well as a science challenge, I would think. Definitely, yeah. And I know I know a handful of our colleagues are are certainly doing uh, similar things with with size, uh, seismology and and certainly in oil and gas too. Um, that's a big deal, monitoring what's going on down there, um, both for uh, for damage control and and for future work. You know, so. Yeah, we, we terrestrial creatures are used to the world being mostly stable. Maybe not, maybe less so in California than elsewhere, but certainly underwater things move. That's right. Yeah, it's quite a bit more than than up here. <laughs> <laughs> good to good to go. Well, thanks again, Brian. Really appreciate all the information today, and uh, you know it's been interesting talking to you. And obviously, we look forward to working further. Yeah, thanks to both of you guys. Appreciate it.